All right, so uh, power went out while I was uh, filming this video. But you know what? I, I The dual battery setup is done. Hold on a second. Let's see if this works. I mean, obviously a dual battery setup is not gonna power up your entire house, but it will power up your entire house on wheels, yeah? In this video, we are installing a dual battery setup in the Jeep powered by RedArt. My goal for this video is to make this as comprehensive for as many people as possible, no matter what level of expertise they might be in. So whether you're a master electrician, and I hope I don't do something in this video that makes you cringe, or you're someone that's never done any kind of electrical before, you barely understand how any of this works, but you're willing to learn because you wanna try it out for yourself. I hope this video kind of satisfies both ends of that spectrum. If you know about this stuff already, feel free to skip over the parts that you already know so that you don't get bored. But if you're starting at like ground zero and you barely know anything, then come with me on this journey and I will break this down as easily as I possibly can for you. And by the time you finish watching, I hope you have a much better understanding of what it is that we're doing here. So to get a better idea of how this whole thing works and why you might need a dual battery set up at some point, if not now, let me show you first what it is that I was running before having dual battery set up so you can see exactly why it was time for an upgrade. So let's start with the simple. Every vehicle has a battery and that battery is charged while you're driving with the alternator. Now when I got my Jeep, one of the first mods I ever did was install a switch pod. The switch pod allowed me to install and control some off-road lights because overlanders love lights. A couple years later, I got myself a winch and that winch too is installed directly into the battery. Not too long after that, I needed to find a way to power up other devices that I've also needed. Things like a fridge, GMRS radio, 12 volt socket, USB sockets, a tailgate light, and I wanted it all to go into one centralized hub so I can manage it, monitor it, troubleshoot it. So I ended up building a power distribution system, but even that is tied directly to the starter battery as well. Now when the vehicle is on and you're driving, not a problem. The alternator is charging the battery at a much higher rate than the power that's coming out of it. But what happens when the vehicle is not on, like you're at camp and you have things that are running that's gonna start to drain that battery. Like I know you're not gonna be running your winch 24 seven, but your fridge is taking up some power and eventually that's gonna start to drain the battery until it gets to empty and then you wake up the next day and your vehicle won't start. Now my first cost-effective solution to circumvent that was to add solar panels. The solar panel is plugged into a solar charge controller, whether that's an MP PT or a PWM, not important for you to really know what that means right now, but that solar charge controller will then take all the energy that the solar panel is getting and then transform it into an energy that can recharge your battery or at least keep it topped off. And that worked great for most scenarios, but I found that during the day, we're usually on the trails with the vehicle on, so the solar panel's not needed. And by the time we get to camp, it's already dark and there's no sunlight for the panels to harness. So really, the solar panels did nothing for me all day. And now, with the vehicle turned off at camp, that fridge is gonna start to drain my starter battery. So I would have to unplug it from the vehicle and plug it into something like a power bank so that it can run off of that overnight. And it's fine, you can continue to do that. It's just, it would be nice to pull into camp 
turn the vehicle off and I know that the fridge is gonna run and I'm gonna wake up the next day and the vehicle will still start. And then after that, maybe just only six months ago, if you've been following the channel, then you'll know I installed a twin air compressor in the Jeep and I plugged that directly into the power distribution hub as well. But I'm finding that that's not the most ideal place to put it. Like you want it to go straight to the battery and not into a hub because you have a bunch of other stuff on the hub as well and a twin air compressor really takes up a lot of amps. So let's fix all of this, yeah? Let's, first off, let's take this power distribution system off the starter battery. Let's, let's reduce the load that we're putting on this thing. Second, let's take the twin air compressor and plug that directly into the starter battery, just like the winch. You want things like winches and air compressors and other high amperage equipment to be plugged directly into your starter battery to get as pure power as possible. Now, it's important to mention that when you're using things like a winch or a twin air compressor, turn the vehicle on. You do not want to go raw dog off of that battery because that battery will get killed pretty quick. Crank your engine on, make sure the alternator is charging up that battery before you start using your winch or your air compressor. Now the switch pod, that's going to stay plugged into my starter battery because those are for my off-road lights. And when do I use my off-road lights? Well, when I'm driving around and the vehicle's on. So that's not going to drain my battery. So now we need to address the power distribution system, the things that runs my fridge, GMRS radio, scene light, all that stuff needs to have power so that's when we bring in a house battery thus dual battery setup but the problem is that all the stuff that you're running like your fridge is going to eventually kill your secondary battery also so at some point you're going to need to find a way to recharge your secondary battery back up and one way to do that is to plug directly into your starter battery so that the starter battery and the alternator can recharge your secondary battery works great in theory except that now when the vehicle's turned off and let's say your fridge is starting to drain the secondary battery, that secondary battery will start pulling from the starter battery, then you wake up the next day again, and now your vehicle won't start. Your starter battery is priority. You need to be able to get home. It doesn't matter if your secondary battery dies and along with it, your fridge, who cares? So you need a way to disconnect these batteries from each other whenever the vehicle is not turned on. But when the vehicle is turned on, then you wanna be able to recharge your secondary battery off the starter battery and alternator. And that's when we bring in a DC to DC charger. At its core, that is the main function of a DC to DC charger. It charges up your secondary battery off your starter battery and alternator when the engine is running, and then it disconnects the batteries when the engine is not. But what we're installing today is a little bit more advanced. We're installing the Red Arc BCDC 1225D. That unit is like magic because it doesn't just connect and disconnect your batteries. It, it does more than that. It does things like control the kind of flow that's going into your secondary battery so that the power is clean, the charge is clean, and it knows how to kind of regulate how much power to pull from the starter battery so it's not completely pulling too much and also as a bonus it already has a built-in solar charge controller an MPPT controller already built in so you don't need to get that also for your solar you can take your solar plug it directly into the BCDC and now everything goes through this one unit and has a very very simple system to set up that can also grow with your needs and that is my dual battery set Setup. See, simple to understand when you understand the concept behind it. So let's go over the things you're going to need for your dual battery setup, starting with the two main stars of the entire system. Number one, you're going to need a battery. And for the battery, I am going with lead time. They did send this to me, but after doing my research, this is a really great budget option battery. It seems to be very popular. A lot of people are running it. This comes in normal price $540, but right now during the holidays, it's actually on sale for 266. This is a lithium iron phosphate 12.8 volt 100 amp 1280 watt hour battery. Moisture proof, dust proof, salt spray resistance. It has a low temperature charging cutoff protection and it's a great replacement for lead acid because it's basically a fifth of the weight of a lead acid battery. And the best of all, this thing has upgraded shock resistance, which is perfect for what we do. We're always hitting the trails. We're going through corrugated roads, crawling over rocks, the vehicle's going all over the place. You want a battery that can absorb all of that abuse. Now to connect your two batteries, the starter battery with your new house battery, we're going 
with Red Arc. This is the BCDC 1225D in vehicle battery charger. This is a 12 volt, 25 amp DC to DC battery charger, and it's suitable for pretty much any kind of battery from lithium to AGM to gel to standard lead acid and even calcium. It is waterproof, dust proof. I mean, it's weatherproof. I'm putting my dual battery in the cargo area of the Jeep, so it's not gonna be exposed to elements, but for some of you that might wanna put your secondary battery in the engine bay, you want this to be as close to your secondary battery as possible, so you're gonna need to mount this in your engine bay as well, and you wanna protect it from water crossings, dust, and all of that stuff. This is probably the simplest way to have a dual battery setup because they make it super easy. You have all of your connections here. One goes to your main battery, and the other one goes to your house battery to charge that up. There's also inputs in here for solar. So this acts as an MPPT controller as well. So you don't need to have a secondary controller for your solar panel. You can just attach it all to here and this will do all the work for you. This thing has what's called uh, green priority where if you have this plugged into solar, then this is going to take power from the solar even while you're moving before it takes power from the alternator and starter battery. The theory being is if it's getting power from the solar first, then you're putting less strain on the alternator. If I can still grab power from solar while I'm moving, I think that's just a great feature to have because everything else that I've seen out there won't do that at all. When your vehicle is moving and the alternator's on, it's taking power from the alternator and it shuts down the solar completely. Whereas here, then I'm getting power from many different sources to power up my secondary battery a bit faster. A couple of other things you're going to need. Red Arc 40 amp fuse kit. Now you can buy a fuse kit pretty much anywhere. It doesn't have to be from Red Arc, but when I was shopping for the DC to DC charger, I, it was already kind of there. I'm like, let me just add it to the order and make this easier. Battery tray from Amazon, positive and negative battery posts, a bunch of different sizes of copper ring terminals, Anderson ports. If you don't know about Anderson ports, after this video, you're going to be a fan. This is like the best thing that I've ever come in my electrical life ever. 100 amp circuit breakers. I've had this from my old system. I'm probably not gonna use all of them again. I'm probably just gonna use one and it's gonna act as a cutoff switch and I'll show you later where that's going to go. Bunch of zip ties and these are really cool. You basically uh, screw these uh, into a wall or whatever and then you put your zip tie through this and then you can basically have zip ties along somewhere and it stays in place. Bunch of wire loom, I actually have a lot more over there. And then just a shit ton of different <laughs> wire sizes. There's even more over there that's in like bigger gauge, but this is from my old system and we're gonna try to repurpose as much of this as possible so we don't have any waste. Now the advice I would give though is instead of you parting out most of this stuff, Red Arc does sell a wiring kit for their DC to DC chargers, and it ranges anywhere between 100 to 200 bucks, depending on where you decide to put your dual battery. If you put it in the engine bay, there's a kit for that. If you put it to the rear of the vehicle, they have a kit for that as well. And it makes it easy because you have all the connectors already on there, it's already all pre-wired. You just have to kind of plug things up. If I didn't have most of this already from my older system, then I would have just gotten that kit and made it easy on myself. But I already know that with this channel, nothing is ever easy. So we're gonna go and do all this ourselves. First order of business is to figure out where I want the battery to be situated while steering clear of all the wiring and hoses for my air compressor and then screw down the battery tray to the floor. Now this is a clip I wasn't going to show but I'm showing it so you don't make the same mistake. I had originally placed it here as it's a great spot for it on the molly panel I already had in place but when the lid is closed the unit will be upside down and it was pointed out to me that it's not recommended for the BCDC to be upside down as it restricts airflow and cooling. After learning this I ended up moving it to a wall and mounting it sideways as this is Red Arc's most ideal way of positioning the unit. All right, so now that I know everything fits back there with no problems, the lid is able to close and none of the components inside are impeding with one another, I took the BC to DC back out because we need to 
prepare the ends of these wires. So I figured this would be a good time for me to show you what each of these wires do and also how to crimp on connectors to larger gauged wires, which can be a challenge. I know I used to have problems with that until I found the right tools on how to make it easier. Now let's start with the easy one, which is the blue wire. And this is gonna depend on what kind of alternator you have. You'll either have a standard trigger, which is a fixed voltage or temperature compensating alternator, or a low voltage trigger, which is for variable voltage alternators. Now to figure out what kind you have, if you go on Red Arc's website, you can do a vehicle lookup and it'll tell you what kind you have. And the easiest way I saw is that if your battery has like a module on top, uh, that would most likely be a low voltage uh, trigger. Uh, the Jeep does not have that, so this just needs to get cut and taped up. I'm not gonna cut it fully, just in case I need to use this later. Now the orange and green ones, uh, this is gonna depend on what kind of battery you're running. There's different configurations for different battery types. I'm gonna be running a lithium ion battery and for lithium, they tell you to connect the red and orange together. Now I'm just gonna use uh, a butt connector like this. I like these butt connectors because it already has solder built in. You just uh, basically put your wires in the middle of these and then use a heat gun and that will melt the solder that's in the middle and join them together. Now the brown wire, the brown wire is gonna to go to the positive terminal of your secondary battery, the one that's in the back. Since it's already been stripped, we just need to add a ring terminal to this. Now the best way I've found to crimp larger gauge wires like this is to use a hydraulic crimping tool like this. These aren't that expensive. They're a lot more hardcore than your basic standard uh, wire crimpers. And they come with a bunch of different dies uh, for different sized wiring. This one is a number six. That's the die that I have on here. And it makes it so easy. You just turn this to on so that you can engage the, uh, the hydraulic, uh, drop your connector in there, start crimping it down just so that it holds it. And then all you gotta do is crank it down then when you have that resistance just release the hydraulic comes right back out and this thing is super duper tight now the red wire this is going to connect directly to your starter battery that's in your engine bay so nothing needs to be done to this at this time the black this is going to go to a ground so we need to add a terminal to this as well And then finally, the yellow. The yellow is gonna go to solar. So I'm gonna show you how we add an Anderson port connector to this because I wanna be able to disconnect the solar when I need to. And for that, you're gonna get an Anderson port, one part of an Anderson port like this. And then you'll need the actual pin itself. That connects same way. Now, if you notice, it's super flat now, and I'm not gonna add a shrink wrap to this anymore, just because I feel like it's a waste of a shrink wrap knowing it's going inside here anyway. Now, the way this works is if you look at the ends of this, it looks like a, like a claw like this, and inside the Anderson port, you're gonna see a spring-loaded tab, and you basically just slide this in till that tab springs up and catches it, and then you won't be able to take it out. It's gonna be really secure. See, it catches. And to remove it, if you look inside, you look for like a little space on the side of it, and that'll allow you to pop this right back out. Just push this down a little bit with one hand. See that? Now I'm gonna add a negative cable to this Anderson port that has a ring terminal at the end of it already. This is from uh, the last install. Uh, it's gonna go like this because this is gonna plug into my solar panel that has a positive and negative. So that negative cable will just go directly uh, to wherever I am grounding this thing at. Now the way I've been stripping larger gauge wires, I just use a utility knife. I don't have a wire stripper that can handle some of these bigger gauges. Uh, it's pretty easy though, I just kind of go around it and till I feel like the wire in the middle and you don't want to cut into those but they're pretty strong so they shouldn't and then I do a horizontal cut like this then we'll just take another pin push it in wait for the click 
All right, so there you go. We can put this back in. All the connectors are in place. And now that you know how to add these connectors, when we do a walkthrough of the installation later, you'll know exactly how all of these come into play. After remounting the BCDC, I routed the solar plug to the outside of the box and screwed down the Anderson port. Then back inside the box, I mounted the maxi blade fuse holder as close as I can to the positive terminal of the secondary battery. Here I'm just making a short connector using 6 gauge wire and some ring terminals to connect them both. Then the brown wire from the BCDC will connect to the other side of the fuse holder. Then I just drop in the fuse and bolt it all tightly. So I have everything pretty much, I believe, set up. Got the red arc BC to DC mounted right here. And then that, the brown wire from that goes to the 40 amp maxi blade fuse. And then that comes out to right here. And this is ready to get plugged into the battery. Uh, in the battery, I also added a ground wire. And that goes to this negative terminal hub here where all of my grounding is going to go. I have also uh, the ground wire going to the BC DC and then another one going to solar. I also pre wired a four gauge really thick ground wire which is going to go directly to the battery now coming over on the other side where the wiring is coming out got my solar uh, this yellow is going directly to the BC DC and then the black is going to one of those grounding posts that I just showed you what's great about Anderson ports you can mount them somewhere and then just plug right into it here's the other side of that solar that goes directly to my roof but we're not gonna plug these in together just yet you're not supposed to plug in solar until everything is pretty much set up so we're gonna get everything set up and then we can connect our solar together. Then right over here is the positive terminal of the BCDC and this needs to go directly to our starter battery. So now comes the hard part because we got to deliver power to this system and that involves me routing some pretty thick wire from the engine bay all the way to back here. I, I hate this part. With the Jeep JKU, there is a gap you can go through inside the door jam that goes into the engine bay. Just remove the plastic trim that's there, and if you haven't gone through here before, you'll need to use a screwdriver to punch through the foam insulation. Because I had thick wires going through here previously from my power distribution block, it wasn't as hard to route these wires through as I thought. Still pretty tough though, as they are larger than what I had before. Now inside the engine bay, I was trying to find an area where I could bolt down the second maxi blade fuse holder, but there was just no space anywhere. So instead, I just zip tied it around one of the larger wire looms in the back. It'll be secure there as these things weigh less to nothing. Now I can't stress this enough, but do not add the fuse yet or plug it into the battery. You don't want live wires as you route them to the back. Wait until everything has been wired up and all connections are made before you attach the wires to either of the batteries. All right, so I believe on the uh, dual battery side of things, everything's pretty much set up and connected. So starting with the starter battery, we have our uh, ground cable and that runs from there all the way into that gap in there. This is a four gauge wire. I wanted this to be thick because everything is pretty much gonna ground through here from the back. So I want a wire that will be able to compensate for that heavier load. And then on the positive side of things, we have a positive wire coming out of the battery and into the uh, 40 amp maxi blade fuse. And then that comes out to a six gauge wire uh, that comes in through here and also into that gap. That then comes out through that little hole and into the cabin. I have it snaking down to the side and then underneath the floorboards here and then going through the middle. And then from there, comes out to the back seat underneath the floorboards also underneath this rug and snakes out to right there the negative wire I have that going up and into this hole that's that four gauge wire and it goes to a negative terminal uh, on the other side of this piece of wood and then the positive wire got that going to an Anderson port I know it's kind of a waste to have an Anderson port with just uh, one wire on it uh, and I could have probably just put like a uh, positive terminal post there and connected it there but that would just mean that I would have an exposed uh, post so I would rather just use an Anderson port because it'll be covered and protected and then above that Anderson port we have one for solar um, I'm gonna just plug these up and we should be good
All right, so all the lights are on. The lithium light is on because that's what we set the unit to. The solar light is on, which tells me that we're now getting solar power and the stage light is on. Now I'm gonna start the vehicle and see if we can get the vehicle light to turn on to let me know that the vehicle is now charging our secondary battery as well. All right, there you go. It lit up. That means we are set. All right, now that we officially have a dual battery set up, I am so amped by this, by the way. Uh, the system's beefed up, all the connections are good, solar is working. It's time for us to add our accessories to the system. And for that, we're gonna go back to our power distribution block. This is gonna get plugged directly to the positive and negative terminals of our secondary battery. But on the positive side of it, I'm gonna add a 100 amp circuit breaker, which will just allow me to shut the whole system down with just a press of a button if I ever need to so let's get these on get our accessories on and we are done with this install for the power distribution block I decided to not mount it inside with the rest of the components the reasoning being is that if I get a blown fuse on the trail or at camp I don't want to have to move all of my cargo just to open the lid and diagnose the problem with it being here I simply just need to pull the seat down and I can quickly check if I have a blown fuse now I just need to add the circuit breaker which I will put inside the compartment and then route one side to the power distribution block and the other side directly to the positive terminal of the battery using 6 gauge wire. Then I'll also route a negative 6 gauge wire from the power distribution block directly to the negative terminal of the battery. With the power distribution block now receiving power, I can go ahead and attach my accessories to it. I figured since I'm overhauling the system, now is a good time to upgrade all the ring connectors for my accessories to something stronger and more secure. Now I just need to clean up the wires using zip tie and anchors, put the cover on the distribution block, flip the circuit breaker switch, and we are done. battery setup. I haven't even taken this out on the field yet and already I see all the possibilities of what I can build this system into. Honestly, this was a lot easier to install and set up than I imagined it would be. Red Arc did an amazing job in developing their BC to DC line of DC to DC chargers. They make it so that you basically plug and play and if you just take your time and do it right, it's gonna do all the work for you once you get everything all wired up. Speaking of install, like I said, this was a pretty easy install. It's straightforward. It's just the hardest parts of this whole thing was routing the wires to the appropriate places. Most specifically, like getting really thick wires from the starter battery in the front of the vehicle all the way to the secondary battery in the rear of the vehicle and routing it through your cabin accordingly and then making sure that the BCDC is plugged into the right places and getting that right into the secondary battery and then getting all your accessories plugged into a distribution block and making sure that that's secure. Don't just go and start installing this thing and winging it, really plan it out. The more you plan in the beginning of this install, the smoother everything is going to go. You need to calculate things like how thick of a gauge wire you're going to need, especially when you're going from the front of the vehicle all the way to the back. And you can do that by just going online. There are charts out there to show you exactly how much watts and amperage and stuff you're going to need for the distance that you're going to have it. So make sure you do your calculations, get the appropriate sized wires, and man, make sure you get really good quality connectors. Don't just go to your regular auto store because every time I go to the auto store, there's never really anything good there. Like all the connectors there are just these plastic butt connectors and they never crimp properly. The better your connections are, the better the system is going to run. I cannot stress that enough. I'll link to all of the stuff that I used in the description below so you can just click on that and add it to your cart. Or if you wanna save a little bit more money, just buy Red Arc's wiring kit because it has everything you need to get a dual 
battery setup going and it comes out to be a little bit cheaper than buying all the parts individually. You are still going to need some other parts though like power distribution blocks and smaller gauged wires and heat shrinks and all the other stuff that you might need for the install but you can at least save yourself some money in getting that kit that will take care of the primary wiring of this thing. So let's break down the cost. For the battery, the lead time lithium ion battery, that's originally priced at $540. Currently on sale right now for $260, lots of savings there, so take advantage. Then you're going to want to buy the Red Arc BCDC 1225D battery charger. That comes in at $465. Then you're going to want to put aside about $250 just for materials. And here's my suggestion to that. Buy more than what you think you'll need because you are going to need it. You're going to need extra wire. Who knows? Just buy the extra and then whatever you don't end up using, some of that stuff you can just return or save it for the next install. For the whole system, you're probably going to spend about $1,255, which is comparable to buying like a high capacity power bank. Uh, higher capacity power banks range somewhere between $1,500 to $2,000. So this saves you a little bit more money and now you have like a permanent dual battery system set up in your vehicle. Keep in mind though that the cost for this is for the most basic dual battery setup, which means you don't have to buy all the bells and whistles all at once and install it all at once. You could grow the system later down the line depending on your needs. I'm warning you now though that this can be dangerous because once you dip your toes into the dual battery waters, the cost can grow astronomically depending on how you decide to build it out later. For me, I'm probably going to keep the system this way, keep it really simple with just the addition of a couple of other things. Like I definitely need to get a battery monitor. I want to be able to check the status of my battery, what kind of capacity is left in it, what kind of voltage is coming out of it. And for that, I'm probably going to go with Red Arc's Bluetooth monitor. It makes it really easy. You just plug it into the system, download the app, and you'll be able to monitor monitor your battery with your phone as long as you're within range of that monitor. That's better than having like a physical display that's back there that I have to go check. At least here, even when I'm driving, I can check the status and see if it's charging properly. I also want to get an inverter for anything that I might want to plug into the system that requires an AC outlet. I, this is kind of at the bottom of my list though because I don't have a lot of stuff that I bring to camp that has an AC plug on it. But again, this is just phase one of my dual battery setup. There is definitely going to be a phase two as I build a system and when that time comes, I will definitely do a video. But if you like this video, please make sure you smash. Actually, don't smash. Install a secondary like button that you can click. Subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell so you can be made aware of new videos when they come out. And if it moves you, support us on Patreon. It gives you access to all of our videos before everyone else and gives you access to all of our live streams when we do them. And as always, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Baptism Overland. My name is Asia Sampson, and I will see you next time. Really? Right now? Pressure washing? Right now. While I'm doing a video. Okay. Every time.